Thank you very much, David. We can, we can start. Okay. Well, can I welcome you tonight to this Oxford Interfaith Forum Psalms and Interfaith Context Reading Group. Uh, it's our pleasure tonight to welcome the Reverend Dr. John Goldingay coming to speak to us uh, on the topic Psalmody as an alternative to theodicy. Uh, in many places, of course, we would say that John is somebody who needs no introduction whatsoever, and therefore I intend to introduce him to you as the David Allen Hubbard Professor Emeritus of Old Testament in the School of Theology of Fuller Theological Seminary in California, uh, though these days he's living in Oxford in England. He has previously been the Principal and Professor of Old Testament and Hebrew at St John's Theological College in Nottingham in England, which I told him earlier is the greatest job that one could have in the world. Uh, his books include An Introduction to the Old Testament, A Reader's Guide to the Bible, Reading Jesus Bible and commentaries on Psalms, Isaiah and Daniel. That's on his official list. I'm also going to add that he's recent, recently written one on Joshua. He's also authored a biblical theology, the three volume Old Testament theology and the 17 volume Old Testament for Everyone series. And has also published a translation of the entire Old Testament called the First Testament a New Translation. So he's somebody who clearly keeps himself very busy but uh, has shown great awareness of the book of Psalms, especially in his three volume commentary on Psalms. So John, uh, over to you. Thank you, David. Theodicy has become a significant topic in Old Testament study, and the Psalms are a natural work to approach through this lens. They're often concerned with the way Israel or individual Israelites find life not working out as one might expect, by the basis of God's power and God's commitment to them. But the Psalms themselves directly discuss the Odyssey only rarely. Their own direct concern is to give expression to or model or resource a way of living with the experiences that issue in the Theodicy question. And for the most part, they do it by making it a topic for conversation between Israel and God. So I here seek to engage with the way the Psalms themselves address God in praise and protest and thanksgiving and simultaneously address people in confession and appeal and testimony with an awareness of the issues that modernity and postmodernity raise in discussion of theodicy. The Psalms are concerned with the question, how do we cope in life? with the fact that things often don't turn out as one would have thought they would, if God is God. First, Psalm 1, a blessing from God. It begins, the good fortune of the person who has not walked by the counsel of faithless people. The Psalter begins with assertions that contrast with questions presupposed by the protest psalms that dominate the Psalter. The questions that are presupposed by discussion of the Odyssey. Psalm 1 asserts that good fortune attends the individual who avoids the lifestyle of the faithless and who rather follow the Torah. And it implies no compromise over the assertion, everything that they do succeeds, it says. Only in the Psalm's penultimate colon does it offer any account of why this is so. It is, it, the psalm says, because God acknowledges the road of faithful, pe faithful people. The psalm uses the verb yadach, acknowledge, in connection with God, to denote a knowledge that issues in a practical commitment. Its statement about God, God acknowledges them, could hardly be gainsaid. How could anything else be true about God? So the people of God may and have to live by this assertion. Now, even if the author of this psalm thought this was simply literal truth, the compilers of the Psalter, who followed it with the protest psalms, knew that it wasn't. Yet they affirmed it and placed it as an introduction to the Psalter that implicitly defines the truth in whose light people are to live their lives, even when its affirmations don't work out. It's important that this failure of the affirmation to work out doesn't lead people to, uh, to abandon the affirmation. The Psalter also begins by presupposing that the key question an individual has to face 
is what you might call anthropodicy, not theodicy. The justification of human beings rather than the justification of God. And amusingly, it assumes not only that theodicy is unnecessary, but that anthropodicy is possible. Like the rest of the Torah uh, and the prophets and the writings, and the Psalter in particular, it takes for granted not only that people must live by the Torah, but that they can live by the Torah. Anthropodicy is not a problem. The Torah itself recognises that one can sometimes do wrong, but it provides some ways then to deal with the issue. But it also assumes that it's not so difficult to choose to serve God alone, to decline to make images, to keep Sabbath, to avoid murder and adultery and theft and so on. The question is whether one wishes to do so. And the psalm provides some incentive. Psalm 1 confronts the Odyssey with the question whether one affirms who God is and lives by his expectations, notwithstanding the fact that his promises concerning what will follow do not always come true. Second, Psalm 2, which has another blessing from God because it closes off the good fortune, the blessing of all the people who take shelter with him. In its words about good fortune, Psalm 2 ends then with a promise that compares with the one that opens Psalm 1. Psalm 2 comes closer to giving the impression of raising the theodicy question, though, in its opening words. Why have nations crowded together and peoples murmur something empty? But it subverts the question through its why. Which does sound like the theodicy question, why, but it's actually something else. It's a rhetorical question that presupposes the pointlessness of the nation's action, an understanding for which the psalm goes on to provide the justification. After all, the rulers of other nations are taking a stand and making plans against God and against his anointed. I take the psalm to come from the monarchic period and directly to, to refer to the Davidic king. But its placement near the head of the Psalter would reflect the second temple period and thus refer to the anointed king that Israel doesn't currently have, but expects once more to have one day. Psalm 2 goes on to refer not to attacks on Israel by other nations, but to these nations seeking independence. So it's talking about nations like Moab and Ammon. The psalm does not ask the question, why does God allow such resistance? Nor does it answer it. It rather concerns the question whether the king is going to stay in control of his empire. It presupposes rather than provides the answer to that question. And it focuses on providing the justification for the answer. The justification lies in the fact about the past and a consequent fact about the future that it talks about. The fact about the past is the action that God once took in setting his king on Zion. In a second temple context again, Israelites might take the reminder to refer to the action that God took in setting up the Davidic monarchy or take it as an anticipatory reference to action God is going to take in re-establishing that monarchy. Either way, the fact about the future is that the king is going to exercise forceful authority over nations that seek to assert their independence. You shall or you will smash them, it says. It might be a bidding, but in the context, it's more like a promise. When Israelites, and in particular their king, hear such a psalm chanted, the practical answer to the theodicy question commonly lies in facts about the past and facts about the future. In the light of them, Israelites are urged to live in the present. The psalm's good fortune, its blessing, then points to an implication. 
modern readers of the psalm might prefer that it took a different stance to the desire of nations for their independence, or at least that it affirmed that God has a positive purpose for those nations. In exercising his sovereignty over them and in giving the king quasi-imperial power over them, like the scriptures as a whole, the psalm has no problem with hierarchical thinking. But it does close with the promise of good fortune for all the people who take refuge with him. So who are these people? While the promise applies to Israelites, the psalm doesn't refer to Israelites at all. Throughout, it's they, and it's plural you, are the nations and their rulers. So the promise in the psalm surely at least includes them. It follows up the psalm's related biddings to the rulers. Show some insight, accept discipline, serve God with awe. If they will do that, then they, then they can take shelter with God the same way as Israelites could. The promise of good fortune and of shelter at least includes them. On their behalf, the promise completes a practical answer to the theodicy question. There's no rationale here regarding why nations should be subservient to God's anointed. But there is a practical answer to the question of how they would be wise to live their life. It lies in accepting the hierarchy God prescribes and taking the shelter that it offers. So that's Psalm 1 and Psalm 2. Third Psalm 3, which is an appeal to God. Uh, the appeal, again, starts off with a question, more or less. God, how many are my adversaries? If one continues to follow the order of the Psalms as the Psalter initially unfolds then, some general and some specific irony attaches to Psalm 3. The general irony is the clash between the promises in Psalms 1 and 2 and the protests that begin in Psalm 3. Someone who prays Psalm 3 is not finding that good fortune is attending them. They are troubled by the reality that issues in the theodicy question. How does one resolve the clash between the affirmations in Psalms 1 and 2 and the experience that Psalm 3 presupposes? The question Psalm 3 directly raises is not a theological or philosophical one, but a practical one, perhaps a double practical one. The Psalm speaks for someone in physical danger who could understandably be tempted to agree with people who declare that the situation did not seem at all secure. One would suspect that the question attributed to, 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 to foes externalises the question uh, arising in the, in the suppliant's own mind. The response in the psalm then has several aspects. First, the psalm begins by addressing God. Now, that's the nature of a psalm, but it deserves noting because it's the first time the Psalter does address God. In Psalm 1, there's no one in particular who speaks, and it addresses no one in particular. Psalm 2 likewise addresses no one in particular, though parts of it rhetorically address other nations, kings, their, their kings. Parts of it address God's anointed, and God's anointed speaks in parts of it. Actually, figures in the Torah and the prophets and the writings can speak of themselves in the third person. And it may be that God's anointed speaks um, all of Psalm 2. In Psalm 3, though, there's no doubt that an I who is under pressure speaks and addresses God for the first time in the Psalter. Yet Psalm 3 goes on also to speak about God in the third person. Address of God returns later on in the psalm. Now, giving that flexibility in the Hebrew scriptures uh, about first, second and third person reference, one might assume that the psalm addresses God all the way through. But switching between actually addressing God 
and addressing the congregation is common through the Psalms and in Christian humility too. And it corresponds to the complex dynamics of worship. People are simultaneously engaged with God and with other people in worship. The switching between persons in Psalm 3 corresponds to a switching of address. At the same time, actually, the psalm simultaneously addresses God and congregation throughout. And it is, in a sense, addressing God and the self throughout. I don't imply the assumption that the person who is under pressure composed this psalm. I assume it is likely that a regular psalm composer composed it for use by or on behalf of someone who is under pressure. But in speaking to the for the self and speaking to other people as well as to God, the psalm's dynamic does overlap with the dynamics of the Odyssey. Though it does so in a way that draws attention to a further difference between the psalms and the Odyssey. Before and after Gottfried Leibniz introduced the word theology, the theodicy, <clears throat> in general, people who were engaged in discussions of theodicy were not people who were themselves experiencing inexplicable trouble, but people who were asking questions about the trouble that had come to others. And it's still the case. They are seeking to understand the world and reality, or to question the understanding that other people have. It happened classically in the aftermath of the Lisbon earthquake, not long after Leibniz's time. But the people engaged in the discussion are addressing other speakers and other writers. In the psalm, it's the troubled person who speaks or writes. Or the composer is adopting that person's position in writing on their behalf. The first person singular suffix, me and my, alone occurs 13 times in the psalm. It's this I who is in trouble, who both addresses God and addresses other people. The psalm thus fulfills two functions. Addressed to God, it urges action on God's part. Rise up, God, it says. There's been an increased appreciation over the past 50 years in the United States and in Europe for the lament psalms, such as this one. There has been largely an appreciation for them as an outlet for feelings of wretchedness and worry and doubt that middle class Westerners are inclined to keep inside and not to think that they may properly express to God. Entitling these Psalms Lament Psalms, as became customary, fits this assumption about their significance. Lament is a dominant feature of these Psalms and using them in this way will have been good for the people who prayed them, good for the psychic and spiritual health of Westerners. But as a whole, Psalm 3 and other Psalms like it do not exist simply in order to let it all hang out. Indeed, letting it all hang out surely happens not for its own sake in them, and not even to gain a sense of God's sympathy, but to lean on God, to take action with regard to the events that, that, that are being lamented. The Rastafarian approach to Psalm 137 does more than lament the oppression of Caribbean peoples by the empire. It appeals for the putting down of the empire, my empire. Addressed to the community, Psalm 3 and other such psalms urge other people to trust in God in the way that this suppliant does. Perhaps the suppliant would hope that such public confession would add to the motivation for God to respond. But in the context of reflection on theodicy, it, is, it testifies to a persistence of trust whose testimony contrasts with the current reality of which the psalmist speaks. 
and it urges an affirmation of that trust. You, God, are a shield about me, and you are the one who lifts my head high, it says. No, it doesn't look that way, but deliverance belongs to God, it says. I exhort you, my brothers and sisters, to maintain that trust. If I can, you can. The psalm makes declarations about God that contrast with the evidence currently with the evidence currently offered by experience. But past life and membership of the community has given enough reason for making such affirmations that it that it is possible to continue making them now. He has answered me, the psalm says. I have lain down and slept, woken up. You have struck all my enemies on the jaw, the psalm says. He's done it before. The psalmist isn't talking about what's happened right now. But it's talking about what God has done before. And he will surely do it again. Centrally, the psalms maintain conviction about and trust in God as powerful and good because they live in the present in light of the past and in light of the future. In the scriptures, faith does not, base, does not base itself solely on what God had done in the past, nor does it centrally base itself, uh, base itself there. Corporately, it assumes that one lives life in the present in light of God's acts in the past, especially in the story told in Genesis to Kings and in Chronicles. The Psalms illustrate how there is an equivalent dynamic about the life of individuals, of king and of ordinary people. One trusts God on the basis of what God has done and of what God is going to do. Fourth, Psalm 30 as a testimony about God's acting. In the middle of the psalm, it says, give testimony to God's sacred commemoration. Which doesn't sound very kind of, which is a bit unintelligible, really. The NRSV translates that line, give thanks to his holy name. And the NJBS translates it, praise his holy name. And those are easier to understand, but the words are more unusual than their translation implies. Give testimony uh, is the way I trans begin translating that line. Give testimony is the verb yada, which which the conventional reading is, which for which the conventional rendering is give thanks or give praise. But this translation is more general than the Hebrew word is. Give thanks does match the verb's more concrete implications in suggesting praise of someone for something that they've done. That's the nature of thanks. That corresponds to the meaning of the related noun, noun toda, which is the modern Hebrew word for thank you. The word that you keep hearing when you um, land at the airport and you hear those Hebrew um, announcements and they end up toda, toda. But it's significant that toda can the, uh, that the verb hoda can occasionally denote confession of wrongdoing, which is the usual meaning uh, of the, of another form of that verb. The action denoted by this verb is a confession or an, or an acknowledgement that someone has done something. It's commonly something praiseworthy, though it can be something wrong. Either way. The confession is implicitly or explicitly a public acknowledgement. And this is of the essence of recognizing something good that a person has done and specifically recognizing something good that God has done. It denotes giving public testimony to what God has done. That's what the psalm bids in that line. Give testimony, it says. Give testimony to God's name. But I've translated it, give testimony to commemoration, because it isn't the ordinary word for God's name. It's not the regular word 
It's a word that's related to the to words for remember or call to mind, which suggests a deliberate act. So remembrance commonly denotes the proclaiming of God's name in worship. As people engage in a deliberate recalling of what God has done. This recalling is a proclaiming of God's sacred commemoration or name, a commemoration of what God has done. So it sounds a bit weird to give, commemor give commemoration to God's sacred, give testimony to God's sacred commemoration, but it's quite a distinctive and important challenge. Whereas many Psalms speak for someone in the midst of a crisis, like Psalm 3, others look back, look back on a crisis and give thanks to God and give testimony to other people for the way God has acted in the context of that crisis. And therefore they tell a story. In Psalm 30, the elements of the story are these. This is how things were when life was going well. This is how they then went wrong. This is how I prayed. This is how God responded. And this is the praise that is therefore appropriate to him. The sequence uh, of logic parallels the sequence of logic uh, of a praise uh, of appeal, like Psalm 3. But the tenses of some of the verbs have changed uh, in a vital fashion. In a psalm of appeal, both the good fortune and the experience of things going wrong are past, but the trouble is still present, and the appeal is therefore also present. In a testimony psalm like Psalm 30, the appeal is past, and the response is past, and the trouble is past. In connection with the Odyssey, the significance of a testimony psalm such as Psalm 30 lies especially in the last element in that list. This is the praise that therefore is appropriate to God. Like Psalm 3, this psalm addresses the other members of the congregation, as well as addressing God. It actually tells its story twice. The first telling of the story ends like this. Sing to God, you people who are committed to him. Give testimony to his sacred commemoration. Because there is a moment in his anger, a life in his acceptance. In the evening, crying may take up lodging, but with the morning, chanting. The second time the psalm goes through the story, it ends with the declaration that the object of God's act of deliverance uh, was that my heart may make music and not go quiet as I give testimony to God, my God, for all time. The psalm presupposes then that a thanksgiving psalm is not only a thanksgiving psalm, but a testimony psalm, and that giving thanks to God has little point unless it's done out loud and public. The two versions of the reference to praise in the psalm that close the psalm's first story and the second story make the point in complementary ways. The first of them urges the congregation to give testimony to what God has done. Now this might seem odd because the psalm concerns not what, God's, not what God has done for the congregation but what God has done for this individual who's had a near-death experience. So the congregation is not in a position to give the testimony that this psalm makes. There might be several implications about this. One is that God's acts on behalf of this individual were acts on behalf of the congregation as a whole, if the individual were the people's leader. Another is that the congregation is expected to view God's acts on behalf of an individual, maybe a member of the family, as acts on, on their behalf because they identify with the individual. Another is that the congregation is encouraged to make a link between the act that God has undertaken now for this individual 
and the acts that he has undertaken on the people's behalf in the past. Even more boldly, the second version of the reference to praise declares that the actual object of God's act was that its beneficiary should give this testimony. In combination with the first version, this statement suggests that God acted so that people might, ha might have their own conviction about God's trustworthiness built up. Other people. That connection deepens not only depends not only on what God, done, what God has done for them, but on what he's done for someone else. Testimony builds people up. The experience of adversity that might raise questions about theodicy then finds its response to those questions not only in recollection of what God has done for the victim in the past, but in awareness of what God has thereby done for other people, one way or another. In the present, a victim of adversity might not appreciate a beneficiary of deliverance coming along and telling their story, any more than, it, than it's wise to tell somebody who is a victim of experience to read the story of Job. The psalm does not presuppose that dynamic, but rather points towards the idea that one who experiences God's act of deliverance gives public testimony to what God has done so that the conviction of the congregation as a whole may be built up against the day when they do have that experience of adversity. Just the same as uh, we are wise to read um, to Job in the good times so as to be able to recall it in the bad times. Fifth, Psalm 37, about having experience, expectations of God. Weak people, the psalm says, they will enter into possession of the country and will delight in abundance of well-being. Psalm 37 and Psalm 137, which I mentioned just now, I think are the two psalms of which Western readers most um, disapprove, and both relate to theodicy. Psalm 137 is a strong version of an appeal psalm, like Psalm 3, more explicit in its insistence that God should take action against abusive or imperial nations. Given that Western readers typically belong to abusive or imperial nations, it's quite proper for us to be troubled by Psalm 137. The line in Psalm 37 about powerless weak people entering into possession of the country carries similar implications. Entering into possession of the country was what Israel did back at the beginning. The, the phrase recurs in Deuteronomy and Joshua. One can imagine the Psalm being uh, prayed against other nations by the same people as prayed Psalm 137, but also being prayed in the monarchic period or the Second Temple period by people who are subjected by fellow Israelites um, to the kind of socio-economic pressures that prophets such as Isaiah rebuke. So once again, it is, it is wise of Western readers to disapprove of this psalm because we may be the not only um, members of abusive or imperial nations, but also members of nations that take up more than our fair share of our own, of, of this world's resources, and members of classes within these nations that take up more than their fair share uh, of their own nation's resources. The line that especially offends readers is this one. Whereas I have been uh, young, I have now become old, but I have not seen a right living faithful person abandoned or their offspring asking for food, which has been known to generate the response, well, you must have had your eyes shut then. The rest of the psalm not to say the rest of the Psalter, suggests that one cannot take this testimony too literally. 
it's hyperbole and it's hyperbole relates to its concern for the way to for, for the way its readers respond to attitudes to the issues that stimulate questions about the odyssey like psalm 3 psalm 37 isn't really a psalm in the sense that it never addresses god in praise or in prayer it addresses people who acknowledge god with exhortations about their spirituality in the manner of proverbs and of proverbs theology and spirituality it's especially interested in two attitudes it uh, a vice and a, virtue, uh, and a virtue it asserts at the very beginning don't don't get vexed at bad people now that exhortation fits as ill in the psalter as the claim never to have seen faithful people uh, in need in that the psalter is full of vexation Psalm 37 sees that vexation gets you nowhere or, or rather it only gets you into trouble. Amusingly, the prominence, the prominence of anger in the Psalms is another cause of offence to modern readers. And this opening bidding uh, in Psalm 137 to forsake anger might main, make Psalm 37 one of our favourites, were it not uh, for the claims about the experience of faithful people that the psalm uh, goes on to make. Instead of vexation, says the psalm, uh, the, the psalms uh, at, uh, say, say uh, relax and trust. The challenge of the psalm is to, to the powerful to take action on behalf of the weak against the abusers. They better get their uh, uh, own abuse under control too. Uh, and that for the powerless, it's a challenge to keep trusting and hoping rather than fretting on the basis that there is an evidence, there is evidence of God's caring for the powerless. When people think about theodicy, they often think in terms of the fact um, of an afterlife being um, a solution to the problem. The Psalms have got nothing explicit to say about a new life after death, though there are passages that can be read with that um, reference by readers who've already come to believe uh, in those terms, to think in those terms. In themselves, the Psalms speak of hope to be realized in this life the hope of which they speak is a hope re relating to the life of the people who pray them they don't know how god will ultimately uh, implement the hope that they express but they know he will if they are aware of something like the theodicy question they don't uh, imply an answer in terms of theodicy only of spirituality the author of Psalm 73, for instance, has thought long and hard about the fact that faithfulness isn't, pray, isn't paying. In the manner um, of a scholar thinking about the Odyssey. But that thinking has got nowhere. Nearness to God, good for me, the Psalm says, nevertheless. It's one of those sentences in Hebrew that doesn't have a verb. Nearness to God, good for me. So it could be saying, nearness, nearness to God is good for me. Or it could be saying, nearness to God has been good for me. Or, or it could be saying, nearness to God will be good for me. The Psalms would think that all of those are true. Sixth, finally, acknowledging God. Psalm 46. To turn again to Job for a moment, the Job story comes close to being about theodicy, closer than the Psalms generally do. But its solution to the problem is again a practical one or a spiritual one, not an intellectual one. 
it doesn't think it can solve the problem. It concerns how we live with the toughness that can characterize human experience when we do not have a solution. It comes to a climax with God's address to Job in which he urges Job to recognize and acknowledge who God is. Its emphasis, on its, em its emphasis on recognizing who God is resonates with the Psalms. And one may hypothesize that an aspect of the significance of the Psalms focus on God's person and God's acts lies in this emphasis. And this emphasis being a resource to people when they find life tough. So here is Psalm 46. God is for us a refuge and strength, a fully available help in trouble. Therefore, we will not be afraid when earth changes or when mountains collapse into the middle of, of the seas. God of armies is with us. Jacob's God is a turret for us. When Jerusalem is under pressure, it's a good idea to ask why, because there may be facts about the city that the city needs to face. That's Job's friend's point in Job. But the Psalms say little about the waywardness of city, people or individual. As the story of Job says little about Job's waywardness. The Psalms say, talk much about the affliction of the, of the city and the people and the individual, and much about the greatness and the commitment of God. They emphasize the greatness and commitment of God against the background of the way that life can be tough, both when it actually is tough, as in the protest Psalms, and when it is fine, as it seems to be in Psalm 46 and many others. The implication is that the community affirms the character of God when things are fine, building up its trust then against the times when things are tough, as well as being prepared to affirm the character of God when things are tough. There's no implication that in either context one might not ask the theodicy question, but there is an implication that one would be unwise to get the, the to, to get too preoccupied by that question because of the point that comes out most clearly in Job that the scriptures don't have an answer uh, and and the question of how you live with the tough experiences is therefore is where is therefore worth some focus The interpretation of the scriptures operates in two directions. We come to understand them on the basis of questions that, that our mind, the questions that are in our mind, and a framework for thinking about those questions that we have as the people who we are in our culture. And if we're lucky, our questions and our frameworks both open up the object of our interpretation in the scriptures to us and also provide it with at least partial answers to our questions but the object the object of our interpretation the psalms for instance has got a gender of its own and a framework of its own and it has questions it addresses to people who seek to to understand it usually there's overlap, but not identity, between our questions and frameworks and the agenda and frameworks of the objects of our interpretation. We can thus ignore the other's agenda and framework, if we wish, and simply profit from ways in which the, uh, the object of our interpretation responds to our questions. Or, we can pay heed to its agenda and framework, as well as its answer to our questions, and thereby have our perspective broadened. 
Specifically then, the theodicy question provides us with a way into the Psalms and into other works within the Torah and the prophets and the writings. But the Psalms own agenda and framework lies somewhere else. When we bring our questions, insights and concerns to the Psalms or to other parts of the scriptures, we may well find that we discover things in the texts that we had not seen before. We may acquire illuminating insights. We may gain support for our convictions. But unless we're prepared for a merging of horizons in terms of our agenda and framework and the text's agenda and framework, we will continue um, to be confined within our own starting horizon and we'll miss out. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, it, it is always a challenge to wrestle with the whole question of the Odyssey uh, in Psalms um, as, as a sort of starter while people are thinking about their own questions and we'll have uh, about 10, 13 minutes for discussion. Um, there's a, a move which uh, Walter Brueggemann and Patrick Miller, amongst others, have, have observed within the Psalter and, and you've commented on this yourself uh, in the past about gradually moving from an emphasis on complaint to an emphasis on praise. Um, and certainly a, a number of people have wanted to see Psalm 73 as the pivot for that, and you've commented on Psalm 73 this evening. To what extent do you think that the book of Psalms itself is therefore working out the, the theodicy in that move between complaint and praise, or is they are, are these different expressions of what it is to live within the issue of theodicy? Um, maybe it could be both of those. I mean, I think the fact that um, the first half of the Psalter, where there's more of that protest, is there. Um, it's not just abandoned. The Psalter is not just praise. Um, indicates that the, the Psalter as a whole is still taking the protest seriously. Um, but as it, it insofar as it does move more towards um, praise, then it pushes you into, in a way, if you like, the kind of uh, direction that I was talking about, but not talking about in that framework of the order of the Psalter, uh, in what I was just, in what I've been saying. But it is noteworthy that um, still it's the case that some of the most outrageous of the protest psalms, 137 I mentioned, comes near the end. Yep. Psalm 88 comes way after the way after the middle and praise comes at the beginning. So there's interaction between between them as well as a movement. Well, that uh, brings us to seven o'clock, which is the end of our session. So again, can I ask you all just to uh, thank John for um, his paper this evening? Uh, it's been stimulating. We've had lots to, to think about. Um, and I can see a number of uh, hand claps uh, emerging as well as uh, uh, in real life. So there we are. That's the virtual world in which we live in. We get both forms of those as well. So, John, thank you very much for your contribution. Thank you for uh, the things you've been able to share with us. Um, I mentioned, David, sorry, that um, if anybody wants to read the paper, it's it's on my website, which is johngoldingo.com. Okay, fantastic. So johngoldingo.com. Uh, and a copy of the paper is there for us. And then there's a, another link uh, that uh, is there uh, that Thea's just pointed for us. So um, before, we, before we shut down, uh, I'll just give you all a moment to check that link if you want to. Um, and uh, otherwise, thank you all for your presence here this evening and uh, look forward to sharing with you at the next uh, gathering. Good night. Thank you. Everyone.